Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome, and uh, thanks for coming out. It's a great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Rob Walker. Uh, many of you will know Rob, uh, who is a uh, professor of medicine, but also a renal physician uh, by specialization. And so he's going to talk today mm -hmm. about um, gout through the ages. And there are a whole lot of interesting characters, I believe, going to turn up. Uh, so, Rob, look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Right. Welcome, everyone. And I've left the mask off because you wouldn't hear me through it. So I'm far enough away, so I don't think it'll be a problem. Okay. Can we just turn that volume down a little bit? Because I'm incoming. Is that better? There we go. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll start from the kidney point of view. And this is a lovely quote that I use all the time from the Talmud about what the organs of the body actually do. And they originally thought that the organs of the body performed ten different functions, of which the kidney was to furnish the human being with thought. Now we know that's not quite right, but I'm certainly going to simulate some thought today, and the kidneys do get a mention throughout all of this. Oops. I don't know if I can do that. No. There we go. And nephrology is probably the most oldest of all the specialties in medicine. Hippocrates hypothesized that the urine was a filtrate of the four humours which came from the blood and was filtered through the kidneys. He was the only he was the first physician also to realise the importance of actually testing the urine. Back then you didn't undress a patient to look at them, you didn't even touch them because that was culturally inappropriate. But you did at least gaze at their wheeze to make your pontifications. So he was well ahead of his time, knowing the importance of urine analysis. If we move through the ages, then the French physician, de Cabal, who was the royal physician to King Philip Augustus in the sort of 12th century, he pioneered uroscopy. Not only did he sort of make it an art form, but he also invented the vessel or the matrina to actually examine the urine properly. It had to be a conical flask like this, so you could look through it all at different angles to look at the different colours or balance in that urine. It was made up of the four humours, sanguine, colic, melancholic and phlegm. It was the balance of those humours reflected in the urine that determined your health. So this matrina became very much the badge of honour of physicians. So your matula in those days is similar to the physicians nowadays wearing their stethoscopes around the neck. And it was the art of the physician, because certainly there was no science behind it, but we still have that problem to a certain extent in medicine. There's many famous physicians who knew the importance of looking at the urine. And Pliny the Elder, perhaps, is the most well-known of the Roman physicians back at the turn of this, um, 50 AD, and he has this lovely quote in one of his many tomes that he wrote, that the examination of the urine are obtained signs of good health, and the former is clear in the morning and becomes progressively darker through the course of the day. A clear urine is indicative of digestion taking place, whereas a dark colour is a sign that it has been completed. And that's probably fair enough too. Your chromogenes and everything else are going to break down your food, make your yellow, your urine yellow. However, more importantly, even back then, the presence of blood in the urine is indicative of a serious disease. And nothing's changed 2,000 years later. Hematuria is still a bad sign that needs to be investigated and not ignored. So, we'll come back to the kidneys and gout, but let's go back to gout. And again, gout is actually a very ancient disease. The very first report or evidence of gout in humans was found in a mummy back in the old Coptic Egyptian period, estimated from the tomb of Isis. Now the tomb of Isis was now originally the underwater, because it's been dammed by the Assam Dam, so they relocated most of this temple onto an island in the middle of that dam. So it was in this area, or related to the temple that that mummy was found, that had clear evidence of gouty destruction in his or her joints. And Imatop, back in 27th BC, was the one that identified gout, although it wasn't called gout, obviously, back in those days, as a distinct disorder causing destructive arthropathies. Most of the time it was known as pedagra. 
and there's a gay aphorism that Pythagoras is the daughter of Bacchus and Venus. And here is our first link with the kidneys. Bacchus, with his nice red wine, making plenty of good urine. But there was things that Hippocrates associated with Pythagora, which partly are true still, that eunuchs don't take gout nor become bald, suggesting that the role of testosterone predisposes to individuals to gout. A woman does not take gout unless her menses are stopped, suggesting that the estrogens perhaps have a protective role on your uric antacid levels. And that is certainly the case. Most premenopausal women do have lower levels of uric acid compared to men. I'm not sure about this one, though. A young man does not take gout unless he indulges in coitus. Maybe that was just some moral issues coming to the fore rather than any science. But the gouty affliction subsides over a 40-day period, which may or may not be correct unless there's treatment. There's been numerous superb descriptions of gout, and this is probably the first one that captured the essence of gout over 2,000 years ago from Aretas of Cappadocia, a famous Greek physician. Pain seizes the great toe, then the forepart of the heel upon which we rest. Next it comes to the arch of the foot. The ankle joint swells last of all. No other pain is more severe than this, nor iron screws, nor cords, nor the wound of a dagger, nor burning fire. It's probably a fairly apt description of flora pedagra for those of you that have been unfortunate to discuss it. Come on. He was also the first to suggest that there may or may not be a degree of inheritance. There was a gouty diathesis that was not necessarily, you know, could be possibly passed from generation to generation. And we'll come back to that one shortly. But perhaps of all the ancient groups, it was the Romans that were first really associated with gout. It wasn't isolated cases, it was pandemic in the Roman Empire, but pandemic amongst the patricians. The plebeians did not get gout. It was very much the wealthy, ruling upper classes of Rome that suffered from gout. And this famous physician, Sir Alfred Garrett, who later became the Queen Victoria's physician, was the first to note the association between the use of fermented liquors as the most powerful predisposing factor to gout within the Roman Empire. And just to keep Terry happy, some nice radiology here. This is a X-rays from a body exhumed back from Imperial Rome in the 1st and 2nd century AD, and you can quite clearly see the gouty erosions in the metatarsals and the tarsal bones of the foot, both here and on the X-rays. Classic appearances that we still see today from time to time in those whose gout has not been treated aggressively. So it was certainly well known. And Perhaps one of the more famous emperors that was well known to have gout was Claudius. He was also known to suffer from disturbed speech, weak limbs, crippling stomach aches, slobbering fits of excessive inappropriate laughing. And they're not features of gout. They're features of something else, which may come back to the link with gout. And again, there's numerous descriptions comparing the patricians to the plebeians. The masters are less strong, less healthy, less able to endure labour than servants. The countrymen more strong than those bred in the city. Those who feed meanly than those who feed daintily. And generally the latter live longer than the former. Nor are there any other persons more troubled by gout, although that's a modern translation, dropsies, colic and the likes, than those condemning a simple diet rather than living on these prepared dainties. And that set the scene for what probably is causing the gout. So why do we blame the wine? Well, we'll come back, and of the most likely constituents of ancient wine, because in fact it tastes a bloody awful. It was bitter and sour, they had to sweeten it quite substantially. Probably poor fermentation in dirty tanks and not really having the, the nice clean tanks that we have nowadays for our products. So lead is one of those that most actively potentiates gout. And it was a German physician back in the 17th century, Welker, who was the first to attribute all of these symptoms to the practice of adding lead acetate to wine. So not just the gout, but the colic, 
the neurological symptoms and the kidney damage were all related to lead acetate. So that comes back and explains what Claudius's problems were. He had chronic lead toxicity. So they've gone back and looked very carefully. The Romans were assiduous writers, and there's numerous tomes that clearly dictate all their cooking methodologies, even all these fancy dishes, as well as how they prepared their wine. And they've taken the recipes from these cookbooks and recreated them. But you can see here, a wealthy Roman at dinner, lead crystal glass or a pewter glass filled with the wine and the very rich foods as part of that diet. And one of the most important things that they used was sapper or defrutum. Sapper was boiled down grape syrup in the grape must, down to about a third of its original volume, whereas defruta was about half of its original volume. And it made a very sweet syrup that they used then to fortify and sweeten the wine. In addition, there was very clear instructions as to how to prepare the sapper. It had to be boiled down in a vessel made of lead, rather than bronze, because boiling in the brass and vessels would throw off a copper rust, which had a very disagreeable flavour. And almost certainly, the heat and the acid of the wine were working together to make lead acetate. And I've actually gone back and prepared the sapper according to these recipes that were in those cookbooks. And I've produced massive quantities of lead contamination. Between 240 and 100 milligrams of lead per litre of boiled down rust. In addition, lead was common for their eating utensils. All the cooking utensils were soldered together with lead. Their water pipes were made of lead. And the sapper was also used to preserve many fruits to allow them to survive over the winter season. So the apricots, their peaches, and all those other fruits were often put into sapper to preserve it. Very much like the Latin, now the Italians and the Germans still do with their fruit, put into brandy and the likes to keep it preserved, but with no lead. So the estimates of lead acetate for most of the Romans in those days, particularly the wealthy class, was around 250 micrograms of lead a day which, as you know, there should be no lead whatsoever in our dietary intake. So overall, it was felt that about two-thirds of the Roman emperors, from about 30 BC through to the 200 AD, suffered from gout and other symptoms of lead poisoning. Okay. And it was not limited just to the emperors, but it was all of the wealthy classes that were part of that process. But lead is not just unique to the Romans. Lead has been part of human endeavour for over 8,000 years. So artefacts from Crete shown to contain lead. In Egypt, there were lead products in glass, paints and cosmetics, particularly the cosmetics. Lead oxide is a nice white powder. So all the wealthy ladies would put that on their faces to enhance their looks and so on. That continued through into the 18th and 19th centuries. Lead, acid, and lead oxide was an important part of a woman's makeup. As always, physicians found ways to treat gout. So the treatment of Podagra was discovered in about the 6th or 7th century BC and related to the meadow saffron or colchium autumnale. And this was the source of colchicine. So it's attributed to three Byzantine physicians, Severus, Theodosius, and Jacobus, who were the ones first accredited with identifying the role of the extracts from the culture to prevent and treat gout. Jacobus also was the first to recognise the importance of diet. He recommended a diet less rich in purines, meat, and so on. And this was documented in a medical text by this gentleman, Alexandra Tralis, back in about the 6th century BC. And if you then go through all the Roman books, medical texts, it is well documented of the benefit of the culturing extracts to treat gout. So this is one of the most famous ones from Dante's Discorides, 
who was a military physician for Nero, and his big tomb here, the Materia Medicus, had a definitive treatment of gout using the extracts from that saffron. Unfortunately, like most of those things, there was a very fine line between benefit and toxicity. The toxicity obviously being severe GI upset and even death. So the term gout didn't really appear until about the 13th century. If you look up in the literature, there's two possibilities. One's a Frenchman and one's an English monk. We'll stick with the English monk. So Randolphus of Bocchi, who was a chaplain to the Bishop of Chester, was the first one to define the word gout, which he took from the Roman word, uh, sorry, the Latin word guta, which translates into drop. Because he thought that gout resulted in the excess of one of those four humours that maintained health, dropping down into the big toe to cause the pain. Since then, a number of numerous well-known physicians over the next three or four centuries all had avid descriptions of gout. So Sir Thomas Sidnam was perhaps the first. He himself suffered from gout. The patient goes to bed, sleeps quietly until about two in the morning when he's awakened by a pain that usually seizes the great toe, sometimes the heel, the calf, the leg, or the ankle. It resembles that of a dislocated bone, followed by a chillness, shivering, and slight fever. The pain, which is mild in the beginning, grows slowly and more violent every hour. So exquisitely painful as to not to endure the weight of clothes, nor shaking in a room from a person walking briskly across. Of interest, the use of colchicine, or colchinium, had continued through those centuries until he got it, and he was very much in the mind that the toxic side effects far outweighed the benefit, so he actually proposed not using this as a treatment, which then came into vogue for another century or two, until the Hippocrates and the other people ma- Hippocrates, sorry, making up their own lotions and potions got hold of it and started their own little black market to treat gout, particularly in France. But more importantly, of that same generation, there's the same association of wealth, excess, gluttony, binary, all associated with gout. The poor, by and large, did not get gout to any extent. So we have these old men, or so worn out in their youth, as to have brought on premature old age, with such dissolute habits, none being more common than the premature and excessive indulgence and venery and the like of exhausting passions. And this became the standard cartoons throughout the 17th and 18th centuries of these old, portly gentlemen with bad habits. And in the literature, it was very common. This is Sir John Falstaff from Shakespeare, particularly Shakespeare's Henry IV. Well known as a brigand and drunk in the plays, and a pox of this gout, or a gout of this pox, for one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe. Or later on in the text, the aged man that coffers up his gold is plagued with cramps and gout and painful fits. And we'll come back to the importance of this because his nickname was Sugar and Spice and perhaps its importance related to that. But it was interesting, even back then they started to think there may be some hereditary factors related to gout. So two physicians in the 18th century, the English, sorry, the Scottish physician, William Cullen, gave the description that gout attacks men, especially robust and large bodies, men of large heads and men whose skins are covered with a thick retain mucosa with coarse surfaces, or men of chronic sanguine type, probably just the chronic alcoholism appearance. But, like father, like son, was suggested. And again, William Coden, if the features of countenance outside the body, i.e. these descriptions, are often hereditary, why could this not occur on the inside? So suggesting that doubt may be something you're predisposed to. But there was also an opposite view in the same time. That if you had gout, you were actually going to be protected from other diseases. So there's a quote from Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels. They give the sick man joy and praise the gout that will prolong their days. 
attacks of gout are seen as prophylactic against more serious diseases. According to Horace Wampole, gout prevents other illnesses and prolongs life. Could I cure that gout? Should not I have fever, palsy, or epilepsy, or the pox? Another way of getting protection from syphilis. Probably not. So again, the classic caricatures that we've all seen in the ancient literature. This is early 19th century, 1818. A wealthy man eating his fruits, drinking his wine. In fact, it should be pork, probably, rather than wine. We'll come to that in a minute. And you can see the red-hot poker about to hit his toe. And somewhat prophetically in the painting, there's an eruption of Vesuvius. What is to come? And again, that classic appearance that you saw described in the previous slide. So what was the role of port? Well, if we go back to history, <coughs> during the War of the Spanish Succession, the French side with the Spanish and the English side with the Austrians. So the usual source of claret suddenly dried up. They couldn't get the large sources of claret across into England. There were heavy tariffs put on it. So the English did a deal with the Portuguese. English wool to Portugal imported fortified wines from Portugal. And they had to be fortified. Because in those days, the Portuguese wine was abysmal, bitter and sour. But they had to sweeten it. The fortified wines were from distilled brandy. It's probably that distillation process more than anything else that's sweetened the port. So by the early 19th century, 21 million litres of port was imported in that one year from Portugal. And here's one of the many famous sherry importers in port, going since 1796 at Harvey's. They have big vats in port, uh, Duano, uh, Duoto, Porto sorry, in Portugal on the hills where the port is growing. So what's the association? Again, the parallels of those Roman excesses are similar to the parallels of the gouty nobles of 18th and 19th century Britain. Prestigious thirst of wines contaminated with lead. Because essentially that man's diet was meat and port, predominantly from Portugal. And they've gone back now and actually measured the amount of lead in those port bottles. The main source of importing was through Bristol, up the Bristol Channel, which was a fairly notorious waterway at the best of times, and there's a number of shipwrecks in the bottom of the channel that they've dug up and found completely intact bottles of port from that time. And they've analysed the lead content in those port bottles, and they contained anywhere between 300 and 2,000 micrograms of lead per litre. So again, presumed, are derived from the distillation of the brandy process in lead containing evaporating vats to sweeten the port. And it was the lead acetate giving it that very sweet taste. And obviously the brandy allowing it to be preserved for a long length of time. So, we all know this, it's probably a reasonable quote from Bernard Shaw a century later that alcohol is the anesthetic by which we endure the operation of life. Occasionally it has some downsides, but all in moderation. If we come back to the 18th, uh, 19th century, then lead poisoning was not solely a feature of the wealthy upper classes anymore. So we come back to Sir Alfred Garrett, that I mentioned earlier, who became the Queen Victoria's physician around about 1860-1870, he observed that about a third of his gout patients were lead workers who one or another at a time had sustained symptomatic lead poisoning. Because back then in those days, most of the presses used in cider making all were lead plated. And the glazed pottery that they used to saw the cider in was also glazed with lead containing products. So we had lead acetate into the cider. And he was the first to actually identify that it was urate crystals that were the cause of gout. So the deposit of urate of soda may be looked upon as the cause and not the effect of the gouty inflammation. Of interest, he was the first to actually be able to measure the um, uric acid. He was the very first sort of clinical biochemist, for want of a better word. And he also demonstrated that lead acetate 
at low doses, taken as a therapeutic agent, decrease the urinary excretion of uric acid, thus providing a biochemical basis for the lead induced gout that was seen over the previous two centuries. And again, linking it back to the kidney. He also recognised that kidney disease was a common cause of death in these gouty patients. However, it's still quite debatable whether it was the gout causing the kidney disease or it's the lead poisoning. And it's more likely that it was the lead poisoning causing irreversible tubular damage than the actual gout itself. It's still very controversial. Is there such a thing as a chronic gout and nephropathy? I don't think there is. I think it's more likely that it was the chronic lead toxicity causing the kidney disease. As we move through into the 20th century, then Sir Alfred Sun, also a physician, who replaced, um, who was it, William Osler, I think, as the lead physician, he was the first to start identifying that uric acid came from um, the areas of purine metabolism. He described our captain urea, then subsequently Leach and Nahan showed that the absence of a particular gene, hypoxanthine guanine phosphodiene ribosole transferase, led to the abnormal accumulation of uric acid in the syndrome we now know as leach nahan syndrome. Very rare, but again starting to show other roles of uric acid besides gout. And we now know that there are multiple uric acid transporters in the kidney that are critical for normal health. And we'll come back to those transporters shortly. As opposed to colchicine, there were new treatments developed, but Fisher was the first to actually demonstrate that uric acid was a breakdown product of purine metabolism. Gutmann, back in 1951, demonstrated the benefit of prosibenicid, which blocks the tumor reuptake of uric acid, promoting tumor excretion of uric acid in reducing chronic typhaceous gout. And then Hutchins and Elian who designed or developed the drugs not only allopurinol but also azathioprine, who showed that allopurinol was a potent xanthine oxidase inhibitor, and they were subsequently awarded the Nobel Prize for that in 1988. So a long checkered career related to uric acid, gout, and the kidneys. So let's come back to Falstaff. Was it just all gout? Probably not. Because it's also well known that sugar intake is an important cause of gout. As in, if we go back again into the 17th, 18th century in England, they started to import very large amounts of sugar from their West Indies sugar cane fields that they owned through their colonial power. So it's striking that the rise of gout parallels the rise of sugar intake in England and Holland. As I said, Sir so John Falstaff's nickname was Sugar and Spice because his favourite drink was sherry wine, heavily sweetened with sugar and cinnamon. Many writers from that period of time linked the development of gout with these sugar sweetened wines and ciders. So the Dutch physician, back in again the end of the 17th century, noted that the importation of sugar into Amsterdam was associated with a marked increase in gout as well as caries and obesity. Guess what? Nothing's changed. So, therefore, again, those who love the sweet wine may enjoy the bitter gout with a period of time. And just to show you just that, here's a graph of sugar intake in 18th century England because they controlled most of the sugar imported into Europe. And you can see quite clearly the rates of obesity and gout, or sorry, the sugar increase dramatically over the 18th century compared to France. It suggests that France still had at least the same rate of alcohol intake, but probably much better quality wines without the additives, compared to the sugar plus or minus the fortified port, all having an adverse effect. As I said, what's changed? We now have the same process going on. A pandemic or epidemic of sugar sweetened beverages. In the States, they're even sweeter than what we have here because they add high fructose corn starch. Remember, sucrose, sugar, is glucose and fructose in a 50 50 ratio. 
High fructose corn shah, um, syrup, is about 65% fructose to about 35% sucrose. And that is probably even more important in contributing to the rates of obesity and the higher risks of gout. Because fructose has been shown quite clearly to acutely raise your levels of uric acid. So as fructose is metabolised, you break down ATP to AMP and it gets metabolised to uric acid. There is no negative feedback on this enzyme, unlike most enzymes in that Krebs cycle pathway. So fructokinase does not have a negative feedback mechanism. So the moment you keep putting fructose into the top end, it's going to be metabolised, consuming ATP, eventually leading to a rapid rise in uric acid levels. So this continued phosphorylation of ATP leads to depletion and breakdown to uric acid. Equally as important, fructose does not suppress leptin. So the other problem is you're having all this and you don't feel full. There's no satiety. So you keep guzzling the cans of coke, not feeling full at all. Adding more and more to the obesity and the increased weight gain. So what's the connection between these beverages and gout in the kidney? Well again, there are numerous transporters of uric acid in the kidney. I think the last count is at least nine, if not more, identified. But one of the major ones is SLC2A9, which encodes for your glucose or GLUT9 transporter. This co-transport uric acid in exchange for glucose and fructose. And Tony Merriman's group over in biochemistry have done a lot of work on these uric acid transporters and the link with gout. So this transporter is going to influence serouric urate levels, or serouric acid levels, and the fraction excretion of uric acid into the urine. So in response to a fructose load. So if you have a high fructose load, you're going to get reduced excretion of uric acid and maintain much higher levels of serum uric acid. So therefore, it's quite probable that fructose and glucose can interfere with this normal mediated pathway for uric acid excretion, hence contributing to the high rates of gout that we see. And in the same study that they did, they showed the odds ratio, odds risk for gout attack, with an individual having four or more of these sugary drinks, can of coke, or the equivalent. In New Zealand, Europeans, about six to eight, uh, sevenfold. In Maori, fivefold. Pacific Islanders, almost threefold increased risk of gout as a consequence of having four of those beverages. And that's a can. So if you think of a standard two litre bottle that costs about $1.50 in the supermarket, going down each day, guess what? we have an increased rate of gout, as well as the other complications related to the excess sugar. And this whole interaction between uric acid and fructose intake is driving a lot of hypotheses around is this the major driver for the epidemic of type 2 diabetes that we now see. It's controversial, but there is increasing supporting evidence that it's not just the obesity that's the issue, Uric acid does have an impact on metabolism and how it's handled, as does fructose, with no suppression of satiety, you're rapidly increasing your energy levels, uh, sorry, uptake of um, glucose and fructose leading to obesity. So again, all linked together with the uric acid. So we started off with a link to the kidneys, we'll come back to the kidneys. Despite the bad publicity for wine now and again, we think of what the kidneys are, or what is man. When you come to think about them, a minutely set, indigenous, an ingenious machine for turning with infinite artfulness the red wine of Pinot into urine. Hello, Bacchus. Happy to take questions. You could repeat each question as you get it. I've got one, Rob. You, you made the observation that Sydenham uh, wrote that you know a person can go to bed well and then wake up at two in the morning. What's the rationale behind this kind of diurnal variation or, uh, or, or change? 
I don't know the answer to that. Is that working? No. It's got a green light on. Let's try again. Red? No. Does it need to be turned on here? Hmm? I use the other one. Right. Was he wrong? Um, good question. I never had gout, so I can't tell you whether it's morning or night. <laughs> I'm sure it comes on suddenly, but maybe because of when are you having the biggest feast with high uric acid or high fructose? Oh, it's that evening meal, evening meal yeah. degree of gluttony sitting there with half a dozen ports. It. It's now going to cause a sudden surge in uric acid levels. Yes. That's going to precipitate out and cause the inflammatory response. So on first principles, probably is right. Okay. Just maybe perspiration. Perspiration? Um, I read somewhere. Not sure how that would cause it though. Now, perspiration is losing fluid, water only, with some salt. Um, it's mediated, you know, there is the salt glands respond to out of serum and things like that. But I'm not aware that it's actually linked to uric acid specifically or um, problems with changing uric acid concentrations. Concentration. Uh, you'd have to have a significant loss of intravascular volume to change a concentration of uric acid. And again, it's out of the tissues being precipitated out. So I can't see how it would be affected that much on first principles, but, but don't know the specific answer to that. The other thing, if we go back in time, what is the actual role of uric acid? Because if you think about it, it's only the higher apes and man that makes uric acid. All the other animals, all the other mammals, birds, break uric acid down to allotoin. So there is some evidence to suggest that one of the key things for uric acid, and it's linked very closely to sodium transport, is that maintenance of that internal milieu in your intravascular volume, that sodium and uric acid is one of the reasons that allowed us to become upright and survive out of water and walk on dry land. Just exactly how that's there, because we know there's links between uric acid and hypertension. Um, but just how much is not clear. Um, so there is all those linkages that we're not quite certain of just yet, but generates a whole lot of hypotheses that are being tested by various people. So if you're interested in that, then Rick Johnson from Denver, he's probably done the most work in this area of the role of uric acid, not only in fructose and diet and obesity and diabetes, but also in the area of hypertension as well. So it's sort of quite a fascinating evolutionary story as well that we don't fully understand. Yes? yes I'd be interested to know, are there predisposing factors that account for some people getting gout in their fingers? The question was, is there predisposing factors for gout in the fingers as opposed to the great toe? The only thing that I can think of specifically would be local trauma. So if, you know, if there's sort of repeated low-grade trauma around the joints that allows those uric acid crystals to be precipitated out, that then you'll get a flare there. Because obviously with your feet, you're walking all the time, so it's low-grade tr trauma to the feet that's allowing that sort of precipitation to happen. But that's only a guess. I don't have a specific answer for that one. Yes? Uh, when I was a medical student here in 1981, we saw several cases in A&E of gross tophaceous gout of the earlobes. Yep. And uh, this seems to have disappeared from literature. Is it because of more effective treatment? Yes, I can't say I've seen tophaceous gout in years for a long, long time. I do remember the odd case. It's usually still see it from time to time. Hands, elbows, Ooh, and feet, obviously. Yeah, I was just stuck. Uh, yep. I was around. <laughs> no, I was. I was very much. I was a second year house surgeon. <laughs> um, well, yes, there is better treatment and more, you know, more awareness of that. There is unfortunately still significant problems related to treatment. There's still a lot of inequity related to treatment. So unfortunately, Maori and Pacific, who are much more predisposed to gout because they have a higher you know, alterations in their uric acid transporters, it's not because of obesity and diet, it's because of their genetic predisposition, predominantly. Mm -hmm. They still don't have good access to early intervention. 
They should be getting treatment for their gout the moment they have a single attack. There's still a sort of belief out there, oh no, you have to have three or four or five attacks before you get treatment for gout. Wrong. They need treatment immediately for that. And allopurinol is still very, very effective. Yes, there's a very small group of people that can't tolerate allopurinol. And in particular, if you're a Han Chinese, you don't want to take allopurinol because that causes a very nasty toxic dermatolysis, um, dermatolysis syndrome that's usually fatal, but that's a very mi- rare minority. And nowadays, if we have any Chinese patients that we're going to treat with allopurinol, we'll do their gene testing first for just that reason. But it's a very effective drug, but we also have other drugs that are coming on board that also block xanthine oxidase, like the boxystat, that's very useful. And then the oncology people have um, recombinant uricase, that is an enzyme that breaks uric acid down to allotonin that they use in tumor lysis types and situations. So where leukemia and so on, we're getting a big breakdown of cells with your cancer treatment, they'll pre-treat them with this recombinant uricase to make sure it's broken down so that doesn't cause problems with precipitation. But these people are not getting those treatments and yet you don't see their inner lobes encrusted with Yeah, perfect. I'm not sure why... It's a very Just, yeah. change in the hands, space. yes, but not ears. Yeah. Very rarely nowadays, I agree. Hmm. Yes? Very uh, interesting about the need of toxicity and that involvement of gout and, and various other ailments. I know that uh, Beethoven, his, his hair at his death had a high lead content, which may have been the basis of his deafness. Are you aware of any of that as part of another that's not gout or, or the kidney, but this broad aspect of lead toxicity, and what, how much is it an issue today with still lead paint around the place? Or right. Um, deafness, I'm not, I can't answer that one. I'm not aware of that association specifically. It may well be, but I'm not aware of that one. Lead paints, yes, comes and goes. I think it depends on, uh, for example, the biggest problem was um, well documented back in Brisbane, in particular back in 40s and 50s, with the lead paint off the houses that were up on stilts and with the wet weather the kids used to all play underneath the houses in the sand and obviously sand into the mouth and all the rest. So there's quite a lot of problems of chronic lead toxicity in the children back then that had problems. I'm not aware of it so much in New Zealand being a major issue. The issues that I've encountered, certainly in the past, when the young kids on the farm are told to clean out the old petrol tanks, jump inside the petrol tank, and of course all the lead and petrol vapours they were inhaling was a problem, so I remember two or three cases of that coming in. Um, and then obviously we've had the recent scare up at Waitaki, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, up the road, um, but no actual cases of toxicity reported with that one specifically. John, I you can answer that. I reported, unfortunately, about uh, 92, an 18 month old child oh, okay. who had been put in a second hand cot which the grandparents had painted. And the child was teething and gnawed <laughs> the edges of the r- on both sides of the rash. Right. And it presented with acute um, uh, hydrocephalus right. and died with a, a blood lead of some incredibly high, high oh. values. Wow. And that was just from chewing Chewy the lead. Around the cot. In the so we calculated it probably, it probably eat, she'd probably eaten, I think it was about two milligrams of lead off the, or two grams of lead off the. Of the, wow. That's a beautiful slide showing Oh, amazing. <laughs> David. <laughs> I may make a comment further on that. Uh, between 1980 and 82, there was an article in the New Zealand Medical Journal of lead toxicity out of some amateur pottery glaze process. It was bleaching out of the you know, cups. <laughs> Probably in the phase where they're making those pottery wine goblets. <laughs> And then there's a possibility down south of the Hokanui Moonshine as well, the old lead um, in case distilleries that they used to make as well. But I'm not sure whether that got published or whether there was actually cases. <laughs> but another potential source, because again in the States that was a big issue. The Moonshine Belt had increased levels of lead toxicity as a consequence. Yes? Well, well is, is alkaline still used to dissolve uric acid? I mean, I wasn't your yeah. one of this, yeah. but of course. I've got some 
men with the brilliant case of where uric acid stones dissolved brilliantly by feeding people sodium bicarbonate and baking soda. And stuff. Correct. Um, does it, has any of that speed in the treatment of gout and joints? No. Eating, eating Can you repeat the question? The question was whether, you know, if you've got uric acid kidney stones, dissolution of those stones by making the urine alkali with large amounts of sodium bicarbonate dissolves the stones. And that is still very effective. You know, we don't see too many uric acid stones, but yes, that is a very effective treatment. But the gout itself is no, it's the uric acid crystals that are in the joint synovium particularly that then set up a very intense inflammatory response. The macrophages engulf the uric acid crystals and then that triggers off an inflammatory response with the cytokine release and everything else. So it's quite a different process altogether to what's caused the stones just to precipitate out in the urinary tract which doesn't usually cause a degree of inflammation like it does in the joints. Yes? Um, do you know when they have stopped storing port in lead uh, dishes? Um, I'm not sure that they actually stored the port in lead dishes. They were in big barrels, always the big, big oak barrels. It was the distilled brandy that they added into it, which I presume was as you were distilling the brandy to make the equivalent of sapper, there was that distillation process that got contaminated with lead. And that was added to the port that was then stored in the, the big wooden vats. Because ports always, well, unless you've got a vintage port, usually it's blended over years. You know, and they put it together to get the right concept, um, tasting that they want for that. And if you go and look on Harvey's website, you'll see all the different sorts of ports and how they're blended and what the great going into each of those blended ports are. They all taste very nice, but don't have lead in them these days. <laughs> I mean, also, John? during the 18th century, sugar, because it was expensive, was adulterated deliberately with lead acetate. Ah, okay. So it was sweet. Yes, it is very, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. All yeah. oh, right, okay. That adds to the problems. <laughs> so, yes. Yes, up the back. Yeah. Not across the general population, but just in the population of people who have gout, dehydration seems to bring on attacks that uh, you know, might explain hmm. the question about perspiration. That when, when, when a gout patient gets dehydrated in, say, the North West, as we get into need of occasionally, it seems to be more, that, that more likely to get an attack in those days. That may be the case. In, in fact, if you, you, you have to have significant volume depletion, and as part of that, you're activating your proximal tubular reabsorption of sodium, and uric acid is cu coupled with sodium. So you have reabsorption of uric acid as well as excretion of uric acid. So in the tubules, you have transporters on both sides. The net effect is the loss of uric acid into the urine, but so if you've got excessive sodium reabsorption happening, then you may change your urate, uric acid level. So yes, it can, that could be an explanation for what you were saying around. But you'd have to have profound sweating. The early sweating would be more, I think, a consequence of the inflammatory response. You know, as you get your attack of gout, you get your massive release of cytokines, it's going to cause you to sweat, you know, your rivals, your chills, and so on. So it's hard to know chicken and egg on that one. But certainly if it was profound volume depletion, that may be an explanation for that. I'm guessing, but on first principles, with the sodium handling, that may be how you explain that one. See, like, you know, in the days when I was a pharmacist, my gout patients, I would tell them, on the days when it's going to be in you know, the or warm yeah. or dry, just drink more water that day. <laughs> and it seemed to have helped them. Good. Probably it helps all sorts of things. No, I mean, there's no statistics other no. than my patients benefiting from that. Yep, no, good point. Is there anything online? Sorry, there's a question online. Oh, sorry. I forgot about the chat session. Hang on, we're coming up the top here. Right. Um, where are we? It's not to do with feasting your gluttony, it includes body temperature. That's top one from Leanne. Um, Hang on, let's go all the way back up the top. Sorry, bear with me just while I come into the chat. Right, chat. All right. Um, touched on genetic variation with urethane. Shame you focus the history lesson on non-Mari, non-Pacific, non-Indigenous. 
it is important to view Māori. I agree entirely with that comment that it's got nothing to do with bad, poor food choices, but my brief was the history of gout back previously, um, the whole issue of non-Māori, non-Pacific and non-Indigenous, um, I don't have much information on that, but yes, that's a whole important talk, and maybe that needs to be looked into and done again. But agree entirely it's not related to food choices, it's the genetic handling, although if you've then got a genetic predisposition, obviously excess sugar handling may or may not have some impact into it. Right, where we go? Repeat the questions. Yes, sorry Mike, done that. Wrote out of Africa, possibly the same person. Yes, I think it was the same one, David. That I did. I apologise to Karen Blix, and I did change the wording of that quote slightly to put in the Pinot Noir. Right, where are we? Veterinary question. Kia gets lead poisoning from chewing sweet lead top nails. Do they or other birds or animals get gout? The simple answer is no, because they have an enzyme, uricase, that breaks down uric acid, so it doesn't form as uric acid crystals. They may get problems with the lead poisoning still, affecting other organ systems, but they don't actually get gout. Um, so we've got there, so we've got that question. Right, anything else coming through? No other questions at present. Up the back, yes? Just, uh, I'm asking a question from Karen Dixon. I would, uh, on your slide, you had her as a 19th century writer. I would have regarded her as a 20th century yes. <laughs> Well, I may have got that wrong. I stand corrected. <laughs> It was just where I got the quote from, had her listed as Karen Bex in the 19th century. But, so I didn't go and check that one, so I will check that and see if it is 20th century. <laughs> Rob, Rob, could you just step me through that thing again that I didn't get quite clear in my mind, that humans and um, ape-like animals are the only ones that do not have the uricase. Is that correct? Correct. Everything else has got a uricase? Yes. Right. So it's part of evolution. Mammals and birds. Yes, they all have uricates. Okay. So it's just the higher apes in man that don't have uricates and lots of uricates as part of the evolution. And again, exactly how and why that was the case. As I said, some of it's related to us becoming more upright, but how that affected and why we needed uric acid for that is not clearly sorted out. But there are some interesting hypotheses around that. And as I said, Rick Johnson from Denver probably is the best one to look up that for. Up the back. I was just going to say, um, uric acid does, I think, have some antioxidant capabilities. And I think humans and apes might have this sort of other antioxidants in uric acid. Now we feel something wrong. Yes, that's correct. There is an antioxidant role of uric acid, but again, high levels can be oxidant as well. So it's a balancing act once again, like most things in nature. Humans have lost the ability to produce ascorbic acid, which lower creatures have, and there might be a relationship with that ascorbic acid is an antioxidant. Yes. So we've we have kind of uh, we have traded one antioxidant for another. Yes, another. could well be the case. Certainly. So again, lots of things that we don't know and need more exploration. <coughs> Oh, yes, when you start getting this discover of association with the lead and the sweetening, with, uh, was there any public health efforts to try and change this? No, the, change question. The, lead. the question was, were there any public health issues related to that? Back in the 19th century, I don't think so. I may be wrong. Um, I'd have to go back and look at those um, Garrett's work in detail. But um, the associations were there. So yes, maybe they worked on changing the lead presses. And not making the cider, um, but I can't answer that one. I haven't looked into that. Certainly, that was a time when they started with public health. Uh, you know, the classic one being cholera and the water pumps in London. All right. Any other questions? All right. More. Okay. Thank you all very much. There's nothing else on the screen. No. Good. Thank you. Rob, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation.